Our topic is the U.S. war in Syria. What's at stake from several different perspectives? I'm Sarah Flounders from the International Action Center, and I say welcome. We are meeting at a time when there's kind of an international reality show underway, except it's happening in real time. Edward Snowden on the run. This is a situation where the whole world literally is rooting for him. I mean, there, there are billions of people who are watching this, who are hooked to this. You have the U.S. government making dire threats on China and then Russia and how dare Ecuador, we can squeeze you, we can cut off your trade, threats on Cuba, don't you dare receive him. It's important to recognize that the whole world is very much enjoying at this point thumbing their nose at an absolutely arrogant superpower. And there's outrage at the revelations, something we all know well, but of every phone call, every email, every cable, every possible transaction in the hands of a government that is making war on the world. When you look at the rage, for example, of WikiLeaks and its revelations, just a couple of years ago, the Washington Post actually April 18th, 2011, wrote a rather detailed article on the U.S. funding of the Syrian opposition. And it was based on WikiLeaks cables from April of 2009. So that really shows this goes back a little ways before even the outbreak of the military struggle underway, that the, the support and the plan for building an opposition with U.S. funds was very much in place long before. And, and our speakers tonight will also look at the policies, at the sanctions, at the weapons flowing in, and so on. Our first speaker, Dr. Gias Musa, is the Director of Communications for the Syrian American Forum. He is a longtime activist within the Arab American community and friends, and when he finds some spare time, he's a cardiologist in New Jersey. He's uh, very much a longtime activist with the Syrian American Forum, which is an organization that advocates rejection of violence and foreign military intervention in Syria. The Syrian American Forum calls for dialogue among all Syrians in order to end this conflict and preserve the sovereignty, territorial integrity, unity, and plurality of secular Syrian society. The Syrian American Forum has worked extensively in the U.S. on different levels and beyond to explain the true nature of this international campaign against Syria, the state, and to promote dialogue based on the Geneva Declaration of June 2012. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Gias Musa. We've been working in uh, trying to stop the U.S. government from supporting the rebels for a while, and now we're happy to see that we have friends that we can uh, join hands together and we can hopefully get somewhere together. We think that the, the administration decision to, to arm the rebel is really short-sighted, but why? Uh, the first reason, and probably the most important reason, uh, the, the rebels on the ground are not the people that you can trust. The American government uh, speaks about some moderate and some extremists. On the ground, we don't see anybody except the extremists. Maybe those moderates are those people that sit in hotels in, in Turkey and somewhere else. Nevertheless, on the ground, we only see extremists that kill, and we only see the Islamists um, appearing in here and in there that think of Islam as a way of using a religion to, to get themselves into power. They're, they don't have anything to do with Islam whatsoever because Islam is way nicer than this and way peaceful, more peaceful. And most importantly, they don't allow killing like this. Uh, from the other point of view, from the American point of view, uh, from, the, from, from the start, the, the American government was helping the rebels. And like Sarah said, from 2009, they started thinking and supporting people to topple the regime in Syria. Now, they could uh, think about toppling a regime, although it's internationally illegal, but nevertheless, they're doing it with weapon, and that's definitely wrong, and that's what we're trying to stop, because it's not about who's in charge in there. What we want is to stop the killing. War is never a solution. What we see on the ground, that the, the government forces are gaining ground, and unfortunately, our uh, 
warmongers mongers in here, they think that uh, this is probably a victory for Iran and Russia, and this is why they are or up in arms, and they want to arm people to try to do something about it, and that's even worse. In conclusion, we don't think that the public announcement that the United States is in, involving themselves in the uh, in the conflict in there is something new, but we we think and we know that they know very well that their friends are not about to win. We know that they're arming their friends so they would last more, so there will be more destruction for Syrian infrastructure and society in general. On the other hand, what would the Israeli attack or the role of the Israelis in the conflict? We see that the armed rebels are concentrating on, on targets that the Israelis are concentrating on, and namely the air defense of the Syrian army, namely the uh, airports, the long-range missiles, the, the depots of, of weapons and communication centers. And in the other hand, the Israelis take fighters that are wounded, they go and treat them and bring them back. And the statements of the Israeli government always in conflict. They want the Assad sometimes, they want the rebels sometimes. All of it speaks highly that they are involved, they want the destruction of Syria, and that's again what we're trying to stop. Even the call for no-fly zone from our esteemed government Obviously, it's not the answer, and obviously, if they were able to do it, they would have done it from before. Obviously, there is some power to the Syrian army, and there will be some obstacles, and there will be some blood, and obviously, we don't want that. And obviously, there is some international uprisings going somewhere that hopefully we can build on it so we can stop this ugly war. Now, is the recent announcement a prelude for action from the United States government? We have a lot of reason to think that the American government is not ready to go involve itself militarily in Syria. But we have to qualify that by saying so far. Nevertheless, the decision to announce it in the open, the decision to plan for a no-fly zone, the training of the armed elements in the neighbors of countries, and the continued provision of communication equipment or the non-lethal equipment, all of it speaks highly that this is a prelude and probably they are ready when time comes that they're going to go whenever they feel that Israel's security is in, at, at, at stake, they will go and involve themselves. We think that the awareness of the American public is the most important thing. And we all have to work together to make everybody understand that we think as the American public, we can stop this agony. We should stop the administration from that dragging us to this meaningless set of wars and death. Since I am a doctor and I'm a physician that graduated from the University of Damascus in Syria, and I have some background about the way things were then and the way they are now, what did the sanction do, the so-called sanction that we're trying to minimize the effect of the regime in Syria? How does it affect the public? Uh, the, the healthcare in Syria prior to the sanction was definitely an, a, a very strong system. First, all education were free. I became a doctor for seven years in, in college and in medical school. I paid maybe $100 in total. It's not a mediocre kind of doctor. I am an assistant professor in cardiology in the, 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 New, Jersey's, the New Jersey State College in, New, in Newark and in Seton Hall University. I'm, I'm a teacher, and, and in the state of New Jersey, we have 900 physicians that are gradu graduate from the University of Damascus, and all of it for free. We have dentistry, nursing, pharmacists, all of them are educated for free. All of medical care is free, and it's public, available for everybody. There are centers, uh, the government made sure that every 10,000 person, they will have a center that have a, a, a doctor and a, and a nurse and a little urgy center in every little village. In addition, uh, cancer treatment is free for all, diabetes treatment is free for all, TB treatment is free for all, it's available everywhere until recent. To give you an idea about where, where are we in numbers, in, in Syria for every 10,000 person we have 15 physicians, 7 dentists, 8.4 pharmacists, you can read the numbers, 15 beds, and these are statistics from the Ministry of Health. As compared to our statistics, and that's in 2010 in Syria, our statistics in 2010, in the United States we have a doctor for every 17 to 29 people in the most richest country in the world. So th they were doing something good. Uh, is it only numbers? No, the health indicators are, are very, very interesting. 
The life expectancy is about 73 years, and that's in 2010. Mm -hmm. The newborn birth with weight less than 2.5 is 9.2. That's comparable to everywhere on Earth even. The deliveries attended by, by trained personnel is 96%. Infant attended by trained personnel at birth is 96%. It's comparable to United States and probably a little better. That's a schematic to show you the mortality of children less than five years old. From 1970 to 2009, the mortality wow. dropped about, about 600%. Same thing, infant mortality at birth. And again, it dropped tremendously. And probably the interesting number is this number, and that's probably the most uh, commonly used indicator of the health, the, the health of a health care in a country is the mortality of the mother at birth per 100,000 mother. It started about, 300, about 500 in 1970. In 2009, it was 52. I can tell you my experience in here in Jersey City where I practice, we have more than 150 in here in the United States. So they reached a level that is really admirable. This is the life expectancy, went up about 20 years from 1970 till now. Now what happened, what happened after the sanction? And that's again, all of those numbers are from the World Health Organization. What's happening now, we have about 20% of the hospitals are partially damaged, we have 37 disabled, we have reduced capability because lack of fuel, there is no electricity, and there is no way to repair tho those hospitals for now. There is an increased demand on the hospitals, obviously, because people are moved from one area to the other because of the conflict and what's happening. In Latakia, that's a city in northern uh, Syria, there is a visit in the emergency department every 32 seconds. Uh, some rooms are used as shelters, obviously, because of lack of houses now. For 70% of workers live in rural areas, like in New York and the around area. And the traveling is becoming really a, a problem because sanction does not allow you to get cars. And obviously, there's no fuel security. It's a problem. And most important, the snipers that our beloved troubles are doing, they sit on a, on a roadway and they sniper one or two people. And then the road is blocked because everybody is going to be scared. So they're not reaching the hospitals. Physicians. Plenty of them fled, but most importantly, even the people that did not flee, and this is an example in Aleppo, from 5,000 private physicians, only 36 are still practicing now. But like I said, more importantly than the uh, leaving is that the system is broken. Now the system of referral, that you saew your primary doctor, you want to be referred to a gynecologist, you want to see a cardiologist, you have a cancer, you want to continue treatment, all of that is broken and it's disrupted. The ambulances are damaged, and unfortunately, they're not able to get the ambulances to be because of the sanction. The pharmaceutical issue is rather interesting. Prior to the sanction, the Syrian government managed to have 90% of the needed medication produced internally. Uh, they had plenty of them uh, bought as a bulk, and then they were able to, to make them impulse, and they were able to manage with that. And it, the, the medication were really reasonable in price. Everything was, was working wonderfully. Now, only 10% of that, those factories are available. What happened to them? Plenty of them were damaged, but more importantly, a big portion were stolen. They take the factory, all of it, to Turkey because the regime is bad. Can you imagine that because of a regime, you need to take a factory of medication from one country to the other? They bombed factories too. We have a critical shortage of all medication, including painkillers, antibiotic, diabetic medications. They were able to manage initially to get 75 gallon per person per day of clean water. And that's not available in the United States. Definitely not available in more than 70% of the countries in the world. But with this critical stuff now, now we, they drop to 25 gallon. Now when, when they drop to 25 gallon, you're not able to collect garbage. And the toilets in those, you know, collective accommodation, what happens is when, when, when people are, you know, kicked out of their homes, the government will have some, some collective, uh, you know, accommodation area like in, uh, in arenas or in dorms for universities and stuff. But now you have a lot more people than the capacity planned for. And now you have more than 50 to 70 people for one toilet. So if you're, they're not able to reach the toilet and there is no clean water and the garbage is not collected, 
you're going to expect, what we're going to see. You have in Syria reg registered 430 diabetic, out of that is 40,000 in children. They're not able to get insulin. The problem is that even when they get the insulin, they're not able to keep it refrigerated to reach the children. The refrigerator, you're not allowed to send them refrigerator and not uh, able to send the money because of the sanction. In Raqqa, which was a big hospital that the, the World Health, Health Organization is talking about, uh, they were a center for cancer and for hemodialysis, but they were overwhelmed because all the hospitals next to them closed and people moved to them. In a center in the United States, you get for every bed about six or seven uh, hemodialysis patients, and there they have about 40 for every bed. So they started stretching them more, and obviously this is critical. And obviously I cannot say, okay, uh, this is $40,000, I'm going to send you a machine. There is a sanction, you're not supposed to send the machines. Uh, there is an early warning system for, for disease outbreak in Syria. In, uh, in 2013, that's the first week of June, you have a watery diarrhea that was 240. In the third week of the same month, in two weeks, they reported 600. There is a 172% increase of diarrhea only in two weeks. The same period of time, hepatitis B, Hepatitis A, I'm sorry, was reported 48 and 153. It's about 200 percent. So this is the start, and that's in, in June of 2013. Now you know that there is a real issue, there is a real problem by numbers, and that's World Health Organization. Leishmania is a parasite that the vector to, to take it from one place to the other is called the, the sand bug. And it was endemic in an area in Syria. They had all the control on it, and they can they can uh, inject the medication and the sore and everything will be fine. Now because every place, you know, people went every other place, now it's spreading all over. They don't have the usual protection that they have those uh, um, insecticide treated nets, bed nets, that they put on people so those parasites don't move to another person. Now it's spreading all over and it's reaching even the countries nearby. Measles, the vaccination, prior to 2010 was about 95 percent, 2010, 2011. Now again, no refrigeration, no what they call a cold chain of command for the vaccination. It's not available anymore. So it's only 45 percent vaccinated now. And now in 2010, 2011, no reported cases. Now we have 139. 77 percent of those reported were not vaccinated. I'm going to stop in here. <laughs> Uh, the question, what is at stake? Right. What is at stake for the people of Syria? And what's at stake right here with infant mortality in Jersey City three times as high as what it had been in Syria? Those are really shameful figures for right here. We're in a country where a quarter of the population there's not potable water for in the richest country in the world. Our next speaker is Joyce Chediak a Lebanese-American. She's a contributor to Workers' World Newspaper and Global Research. She's the author of Gaza, Symbol of Resistance, and the U.S.-NATO War in the War on Syria. She's written on the Middle East issues for 40 years, has helped to organize here at home to get the U.S. out of the Middle East, and really uh, having known Joyce for many, many years, she's both such an effective organizer and explainer. Joyce Chediak. That was very moving, and thank you very much for, you, for the hard facts. Because uh, the, the U.S. Is, is financing this war to save the people of Syria, and the people of Syria are the first and, and most extreme casualties of it. And I, I think that your presentation really brought that home. This is not a civil war. It's certainly not a revolutionary struggle. It's a counter-revolution. The fighters are proxies and foot soldiers for world imperialism and for Israel. <coughs> and for those in the U.S. who are against Assad, particularly now, you need to look at either side and see who you are lined up with. On one side, you'll see the Pentagon. On the other side, Israel. And behind you are the original colonial oppressors in the Middle East. The goal is the dismemberment of Syria and destruction of its territorial integrity and its culture and economy. 
and to destroy the anti-imperialist alliance that Syria has with Iran and with Hezbollah uh, in order to maintain independence and to pick them off one by one. U.S. and its NATO allies and regional clients are using the Arab Spring truly a mass and uh, inspirational outpouring but without a unified leadership as a cover for a sea change in the Middle East to destroy any states with independence and recarve the area for their own purposes. To redraw the map of the Middle East as it did in the secret sykes pico Treaty during World War I to have more direct access to the natural resources of the Middle East and give nothing to the people. Already in a weakened Iraq, instead of even going to their uh, puppet Iraqi government uh, for oil, they're going directly to uh, Kurdistan uh, because they can get a better deal directly from Kurdistan than from their own government. So that's what they want to do. There's no functioning government in Libya, but the oil seeps getting pumped out and they want to do the same thing in Syria. Uh, destroy it as a state, that's my view. Who is Bashir Assad? Are the legitimate grievances against him? I think there's much confusion in the U.S. movement here. Certainly he's not a revolutionary, but, but one thing he has done, he's kept Syria together, and his family have kept Syria together. This is not a Sunni versus Shia area of the world. It's a mosaic. There are about 20 different religious, ethnic, and cultural groups in Syria. Uh, and and there's, there's a whole network of uh, uh, ways that the, the wheels are greased socially and culturally. Uh, maybe not perfectly, but uh, there's a lot of pride in this in, in the Levant area. Now, the, the, uh, the, the fighting is seeking to destroy all that. People are being killed by identity and religion. Uh, the suspicion is being created and there are population shifts due to it. Um, Assad has protected the Palestinians. The, the Palestinians in the camp of Syria are treated the best in, in any of the frontline states. He has allowed the, the more radical Palestinian groups and Hamas to have headquarters in Damascus. Uh, he stands up against Syria, and, uh, as against Israel, and there's still a state of war with Israel. Uh, and Syria demands the return of the Golan Heights. But there are legitimate grievances against Assad. There's repression, and they will, they, uh, uh, there have been, uh, in any uh, country where one family has ruled for 40 years, there's going to be legitimate grievances. But, but the, the main thing is that in 2005, Syria went along with the IMF and World Bank neoliberal policies and sold off a lot of the state-run enterprises. Uh, cronies of Assad, the Assad family grew rich, and others did. Many were Sunni, um, and, and tens of thousands were laid off. There was a break, even though conditions remained very good, there was a breaking of the social contract, and a lot of the opposition to Assad was based on that. But that's not why the imperialists dislike him. They like him for that, because he followed their instructions. He eroded his base, and they went right in. That's what happened. There's two sides on this. Now, who's the opposition? The opposition, the leadership has always been from the outside. Uh, calling the shots have been people long allied with the West. Uh, it's been repeatedly said in the press that they're hopelessly divided, fighting among themselves for booty. Uh, for instance, in December 2011, uh, Burhan Balyun, a leader of the Syrian National Council at the time, told the Wall Street Journal that he would open up Syria to the West and serious strategic relations with Iran and with the Lebanese and Palestinian resistance and reallies Syria with, the, with the, the Gulf regimes, those bastions of democracy. The head of the, national, uh, of the Syrian National Coalition right now, the opposition to Assad is an American, Hassan Hito. Not even a Syrian, he's an American. 
The opposition has no political program, no real goals. They rely on the Takfiri groups, al-Nusra and Syria, who are the most effective fighting force. Takfiri, uh, these are unpredictable, uh, way, way of fringe religious groups uh, that come out of the despair of the area and they're financed by the U.S. Many started in Iraq under the U.S. occupation. They did not exist there under Saddam Hussein. According to Hasra, uh, Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah, these are Sunni groups that accuse other groups of apostasy, which to them is punishable by death. In Iraq, he said they have killed Shias and Sunnis, blown up mosques and churches, killed tribal elders, killed people lining up to vote, which is considered apostasy, between four and 5,000 suicide bombers on a religious basis. They exist in Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Somali, and now Syria. They, they also kill Sunnis who don't agree with them. This is not a Shia versus Sunni thing. Another name for them would be death squads. So how did they get in Syria? In 2005, the US withdrew its ambassador but Syrians put in these economic uh, neoliberal policies. So the ambassador came back in 2011. They sent John Ford. Now, John Ford studied under Negroponte in Iraq, the ambassador. People remember Negroponte from, uh, from the 80s? He set up the death squads in El Salvador. Well, many feel that he is responsible for the beginning of these takfiri groups in Iraq. And uh, John Ford was his acolyte. Um, two months after Ford came into office in Syria, the fighting started. Uh, he can, he's no longer ambassador there, but he continues to direct the U.S. aspect of that campaign uh, from Washington. He made a secret visit to Syria last month uh, as part of that effort. So the U.S. has it both ways. They say they hate Assad and they hate al-Nusra. But they're, they're pushing al-Nusra. They're behind al-Nusra. They've resurrected groups like this. They use racism and anti-Islam bigotry as their weapon. The imperialists then try to lump all religious forces in the Middle East together. But the truth is that they hate it when anti-imperialists fight in the name of religion, like the Iranian Revolution, like Hezbollah in Lebanon. And But they work very hard to foment and finance oppressed peoples and workers fighting each other in the name of religion. And the imperialists try to make this happen as much as they can. We must not be fooled by this nor by the racist war against Islam, a religion of the oppressed, being waged by the U.S. government right here at home as well as abroad. The real reason, I think, that the U.S. is upping the ante, that it's, it's giving small uh, arms web, that's talking about uh, no-fly zone, is that it's really lost on the ground. The, the major battles in the border areas uh, with Lebanon have been pretty decisive. Uh, the fighting continues, but the, the so-called rebels have all but lost. The media says it's because of Hezbollah. Well, Hezbollah has maybe a thousand, maybe two thousand fighters. It's a small group in, in a small country. But this could not have happened without support from the Assad government among the Syrian people. According to information collected by NATO and published May 31st by Middle East Newsline, 70 percent of Syrians support the Assad regime. Another 20% were neutral, and the remaining 10% expressed support for the rebels. This was a compilation by NATO of data from humanitarian workers in and around Syria. A quote, the Sunnis have no love for Assad, but the great majority of the community is withdrawing from the revolt. What is left of the foreign forces who are sponsored by Qatar and Saudi Arabia? They are seen by the Sunnis as far worse than Assad. S Syrian Sunnis are likely disgusted by the behavior of the foreign extremists, which include a laundry list of war crimes, ethnic cleansing, as well as the terrorist bombing of a Sunni mosque that killed the top Sunni cleric in Syria. And, and there's a list of, of, of other uh, examples. We don't see this poll in the Western press or, or any other ones like it. 
So uh, the, the, the U.S. escalation is really going against the will of the Syrian people at this point. A poll by Pew Research Center said that 65% of the population here opposes U.S. assistance or intervention of any kind in Syria. So the U.S. government is going against the will of the people here. It says it's bringing democracy, but it doesn't respect the will of the people here or in Syria. The problem is a system which is so enamored with profits above people, above the environment, that, that the capitalists will sell their own mother for a profit. It's a sick system. The demonization of Assad, of Islam, the view that there are no good guys in this, in this situation, leads to indifference. The increase in technology has led to the ability to wage many imperialist wars at the same time. That was not true in the Vietnam era. So there's Afghanistan, there's Iraq, there's Syria, and now there's threats to Venezuela, and there's threats to Ecuador as well. We need to up the ante of the political consciousness in the anti-war movement to meet the situation. We need an anti-war movement that is thoroughly anti-imperialist and identifies it as the main enemy of humanity and defends unconditionally all the peoples and governments that it attacks. Our next speaker is Bill Dorries, who, an activist for 45 years, was among the first non-Arab activists for Palestine in the U.S. Bill was in Palestine with Joyce during the first Intifada where they were detained and they uh, left to avoid arrest by Israeli occupation forces. In 2009, Bill helped to organize the Viva Palestina U.S. aid convoy to break the blockade of Gaza with uh, British MP George Galloway. Uh, he's a member of the International Action Center since its founding. He's an active member of Al Alda, uh, New York, the Palestine Right to Return Coalition and in 2008 was elected the Vice Chair for External Affairs of the International League of People's Struggles. He's also a lifelong union member and labor activist. Bill Dorries. It's been a great week for democracy in the USA, the land of mass incarceration. The Supreme Court struck down Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act that so many black people and their allies fought and died for. The Federal Bureau of Prisons has denied compassionate release to our hero Lynn Stewart, the people's lawyer who's been imprisoned for doing her job and defending her clients. And Edward Snowden, another hero, is on the run for telling the people of this country that the United States government, the NS National Security Agency, the most expensive U.S. government agency, is spying on pretty much everybody in the world. Meanwhile, John boots on the ground Kerry the 2004 so-called anti-war candidate who complained Bush hadn't sent enough troops to Iraq uh, has virtually taken up residence in the Arab world working hands-on with the royal families, the royal tyrants of Saudi Arabia and Jordan and the Gulf, the Arabian Gulf to bring Washington's version of democracy to Syria. Yesterday he was in Qatar where the Saudi Arabia just engineered a coup, forcing the emir to resign in favor of his even worse son, which the Syrian National Council called a pioneering event. The Syrian National Council is the US, US supported opposition uh, leaders. The king giving the power to his prince is a pioneering blow for democracy. Before that, he was in Egypt, where President Morsi had actually lightened, taken a less belligerent position on Syria, and Kerry showed up. And now, uh, af right after that, Morsi uh, removed, uh, broke relations with Syria. We can see Kerry's version of freedom, not only in the reign of terror going on in the so-called liberated areas of Syria, the beheadings and floggings and amputations, but also the lynchings of Shiites in Egypt a couple of days ago, and in the uh, murder of Lebanese soldiers by Takfiri cleric uh, Sheikh uh, Amir, who is now on the run in the port of Saida. Sectarian war across the region is what Washington wants. It is what Israel wants. It's what the Pentagon wants. They want not only the Syrian soldiers and Syrian nationalists to die, they want the young people who were sucked into the so-called jihad to die. Meanwhile, Guantanamo remains open. Mass racial profiling and surveillance and entrapment of Muslims in the United States continues. 
And there are now U.S. boots on the ground in Jordan, over a thousand troops, with more coming and 400 U.S. soldiers are on the way to Egypt. The bankers, the Wall Street, the 1% are champing at the bit for a larger war. The Economist, uh, last, this week, it's, I wish I'd brought it, it's the, the mouthpiece of the city of London, the uh, Wall Street of London has, can Iran be stopped? Is the front page, is the uh, cover, and its answer is yes, by invading Syria. The Wall Street Journal has the same line, and so does the Washington Post, the Pentagon's house organ. So the question is, can Iran be stopped from doing what? I'll get back to that. I, I was in South Lebanon and in Beirut in 2006, right after the Israeli invasion, uh, right after the Lebanese people's resistance led by Hezbollah, a Shiite-based party, defeated, inflicted the first major military defeat on Israel's racist, U.S.-armed, murderous war machine. I saw the terrible destruction inflicted by U.S.-made weapons on Ben Shabayel and the many towns in South Lebanon, and I also saw that the resistance could not have won, in the real world could not have won, without the assistance of Syria and Iran. And in fact, Gaza could not have held out without the assistance of Syria and Iran. And in fact, the Syria played a key role in helping the First Intifada in Palestine. While we were there, we were heading back to Beirut from South Lebanon. There was the assassination of, of the Pierre Jemayel, the leader of the Lebanese fascist party, the Falange. It was a factional fight between him and the, uh, the Lebanese forces, two right-wing Christian organizations, Christian-based organizations, so-called Christian organizations. And for three days, Sectarian mobs waving French flags were attacking Syrian workers in, in, in Beirut, in central Beirut. And myself and my friends I was there with were about to leave, and I was in a cafe when the TV, Said Hassan Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, came on the television and said, I want everybody in Beirut tomorrow morning. And the next morning, from the north, from the east, from the, not from the west, as a sea, from the south, Shi Sh Shiites, Christians, Sunnis, Kurds, Armenians streamed into Beirut to show support for the resistance and to demand a, an end to, uh, I mean, some political reform in Lebanon. And it was just then, at that very moment, when the potential for popular unity on a mass, when a, a Shiite-led militia had the admiration of the entire Arab and Islamic world, when there was a poten potential for popular unity at a, on a basis at a rare moment that it was very hard to find, then the princes of the, of the Hashemite royal family in Jordan and the Saudi family in Arabia and of the Gulf and, and, and the characters like John, Negre, uh, like John Negroponte and uh, uh, Abrams, Robert Abrams from the State Department began talking about the danger how the Middle East was about to be ripped apart by a sectarian war and uh, the danger of the Shiite crescent, crescent and it had to be stopped. And right away they began working to implement this sectarian policy, to make this a, re this, this, this a reality, this prediction, this grim prediction a reality. It began as with uh, Saudi money flowing to Takfiri groups in Lebanon, like the Sheikh Asrs in, in Saida. Meanwhile, U.S. weapons began flowing to the internal security forces in Lebanon to build it up as a counterweight to the army. This is, this is controlled by the right-wing U.S.-backed March 14th movement. As we know from the French foreign minister, a reformer French foreign minister, Dumas, the British began training uh, commandos to fight against the Syrian government several years ago. I was back in Lebanon in January 2009 as U.S. made bombs and missiles were raining down on Gaza. And I was attending a conference representing the IAC at a conference of, uh, along with Sarah, at a conference of the, um, hosted by the Lebanese resistance. And a major theme of that conference was South-South unity. There were huge delegations there from Venezuela and from Iran, building an economic network around the world that was independent of the United States. But meanwhile, on the other side, in, in uh, the March 14th controlled neighborhoods of Beirut, the Saudi flag was flying everywhere. The U.S.-Saudi-Qatari alliance, the same alliance that enticed Iraq, to attack Iran in a bloody fratricidal war in which a million died and then it, they turned on Iraq when the war was over to destroy it. The same alliance that financed this very similar operation, the biggest CIA covert operation to date in Afghanistan in the 80s. These are the forces behind the war in Syria. The division in the Arab world uh, goes back Really, a division goes back to 1952, the Egyptian Revolution, the Iraqi Revolution of 1956, the Algerian War for Independence, when two blocs came into existence, a nationalist bloc <coughs> that basically wanted to use its resources 
to, to develop the country in the way that uh, Dr. Musa described in Syria, and those royal families who will, were willing to turn their country, <coughs> their countries and all their oil resources into cash cows for Wall Street banks, for the arms contractors, and for the oil companies. The, the war was fought out in a bloody proxy war in Yemen in the early 60s, and uh, it was the Israeli attack on Syria and Egypt in 1967 that tilted the balance in favor of the royal families against by weakening, by de devastating the Egyptian and Syrian economies. So the Saudi monarchs really owe their thrones and their heads to Israel, but they repaid that many times over because there's plenty of Saudi money going into Israel via Wall Street. There are those on the left who say that the Syrian government is not genuinely anti-imperialist. They say it's just acting out of its material interests. Duh. Yeah. <laughs> People, states, and classes do act out of their own material interests. But there is a real conflict of material interest between those <coughs> who would want to develop their own country, develop like the R Syrian government, which wants to develop the means of production, the productive forces in Syria, and imperialism, which wants to destroy them. Because imperialism, it's not an abstract word, it's not about hegemony and domination. Imperialism is the rule of monopoly capital, and it's the, the banks, and it's about destruction. It's about destroying any means of production, any resources, productive forces that they don't own or control. They're not afraid of Iranian nuclear bombs. They're afraid of Iranian oil and gas. They're afraid of a pipeline maybe running through from Iran, through Syria, through I Iraq, to, uh, to Lebanon, so that oil that the U.S., that ExxonMobil doesn't own can come on the world market. And maybe the, the, the revenues from that will be reinvested in the region. They're afraid of an Alba-like formation coming into being in the Arab world, in the Islamic world, like it do does in Latin America. And it's to exactly prevent the emergence of such an economic zone. They're afraid of a, a, a Middle East where they are no longer a player, where they don't matter anymore, their dollars and their guns. That's why they maintain Israel at, at, the, at the crossroads of Asia and Africa. And of Asia and Africa is basically a giant U.S. military base. They're not only threatening war with Iran or in, in war in Syria, you know, which they may, may, people may think they can do on the cheap, you know, by mercenaries or whatever and airplanes and no troops on the ground. They're threatening, they're, they're risk, their greed is so great, their drive to destroy is so great, they're risking war with Russia over this. And in fact, you know, this is, uh, if you look at it's what's happening in Syria today, in the Middle East today, I can't help but thinking of the, of the maneuvers before World War II in Europe. Because the same economic forces, that, the different as the government is, the same economic forces that drove Germany, Nazi Germany, into war are driving, are pressing on the United States. The Cold War didn't end when the Soviet Union collapsed because the United States doesn't want any, any industrial rivals, capitalist or socialist, in the world. That's the, that's the drive of Wall Street. There is a force greater than the Pentagon and greater than uh, their, their hoarded gold, and that's the might of the people, which we can see in action not only in the heroic fighters of the Syrian army from all, all uh, religions, and not only in the fighters of Hezbollah who have sacrificed so much. We see it in the people of Turkey, who have basically have shut down the northern front. That, they, that the U U.S. The Pentagon wanted to use to arm the so-called rebels, the Contras. By the way, Saudi Arabia funded the Nicaraguan Contras in, in, the, in the 70s and 80s at Ronald Reagan's request. In the 1930s, when war was on the horizon in Europe, the people of the world, anyone who stood for justice or freedom, knew they had to stand with the Republic of Spain against fascism, against imperialism. Syria is the Spain of today. This time, so much is at stake, we have to ensure that they shall not pass. Yeah. Our next speaker, Dr. Barbara Nimri Aziz, is a veteran anthropologist. She turned to journalism in 1989 with her first assignment in Syria. And since then, she's visited Syria 12 to 15 times. Most recently, she spent two years teaching communications in Syria between 2009 and 2012, during which she witnessed the nascent civil protests, then the uprising, and the opening military conflict. Barbara is the author of five books, most recently a handbook for radio uh, journalists published in 2012 in Arabic. This is right here. She is also the author 
of Swimming Up the Tigris, Real Life Encounters in Iraq, a testimony of the embargo against Iraq, uh, 1990 to 2003. You can hear her reports on Syria between 2009 to 2011 by her podcast, RadioTahrir.org. And she's also the founder and host for 24 years of Radio Tahrir on WBAI Radio 99.5. Barbara Aziz. We were together for 15 odd years, 13 years, working in Iraq. I went with IAC delegations on several occasions to try to inform Americans about the realities of the culture and the history, but also of what sanctions can do. And as Kathy Kelly said, sanctions are a form of, they're a weapon of mass destruction. I'm going to speak about sanctions now, particularly one institution and how the sanctions have affected it. You know, it's a pity that it's only when we have bombs and bloody body parts and um, missiles and rifles and mass gunmen and snipers that we get to know a country. And even then, we don't know it. We see really the superficial. Yes, there's blood. Yes, it's ugly. Yes, there's death. Yes, houses collapse and people flee. But underneath that, there is a more serious, I believe, devastation going on, which I believe our American government is quite efficient at implementing, and I want to talk about that. As you know, I'm an anthropologist. I'm not a political. Um, I'm not a political analyst or a political scientist. I'm an anthropologist, and as in my radio work and my writing, I look at economic, social, cultural institutions. Now, an audience like you, you're, I know you're very sophisticated, I'm not trying to flatter you, but you know that everything, everything is political. So it's not just about parties and leadership, it's about the basic infrastructure of a society. Poison gas, foreign fighters, sectarian massacres, 90,000 dead, no-fly zones. These frightening, unhelpful, and wearying words define Syria today. So let's take time for another drama. Sy Syrian TV serials. Now don't laugh, please. Yes, the topic may seem inconsequential and out of place in a nation engulfed in violent conflict. But the subject is not too trivial for U.S. design sanctions against its latest Arab enemy. Since 2012, Syrian TV has been dumped off the satellite Hotbird and U.S. allies in the Gulf states who co-sponsored, transmitted, and once celebrated, enjoyed Syrian TV dramas already withdrew their support and infrastructure for international distribution of Syrian TV programs. Now why would they do that? The wider public, people who really know little about Syria except for conflict related news during these two years are told that Syrian opinion is controlled by state media and free speech is prohibited there. It is difficult to talk freely in the country on a range of sub subjects, but much and most of what people are concerned with can be discussed and can be created through art and literature. So what could emanate, given that we are told that uh, there is such severe censorship, what could emanate from that so-called brutal dictatorship that could be of any value to cause TV dramas to be embargoed and a valued industry crushed about the realities of the culture and the history, 
but also of what sanctions can do. And as Kathy Kelly said, sanctions, they're a weapon of mass destruction. I'm going to speak about sanctions now, particularly one institution and how the sanctions have affected it. You know, it's a pity that it's only when we have bombs and bloody body parts and um, missiles and rifles and mass gunmen and snipers that we get to know a country. And even then, we don't know it. We see really the superficial. Yes, there's blood. Yes, it's ugly. Yes, there's death. Yes, houses collapse and people flee. But underneath that, there is a more serious, I believe, devastation going on, which I believe our American government is quite efficient at implementing, and I want to talk about that. As you know, I'm an anthropologist. I'm not a political, um, I'm not a political analyst or a political scientist. I'm an anthropologist, and as in my radio work and my writing, I look at economic, social, cultural institutions. Now, an audience like you, you're, I know you're very sophisticated. I'm not trying to flatter you, but you know that everything, everything is political. So it's not just about parties and leadership. It's about the basic infrastructure of a society. Poison gas, foreign fighters, sectarian massacres, 90,000 dead, no-fly zones. These frightening, unhelpful, and wearying words define Syria today. So let's take time for another drama. Sy Syrian TV serials. Now don't laugh, please. Yes, the topic may seem inconsequential and out of place in a nation engulfed in violent conflict. But the subject is not too trivial for U.S. design sanctions against its latest Arab enemy. Since 2012, Syrian TV has been dumped off the satellite Hotbird and U.S. allies in the Gulf states who co-sponsored, transmitted, and once celebrated, enjoyed Syrian TV dramas already withdrew their support and infrastructure for international distribution of Syrian TV programs. Now why would they do that? The wider public, people who really know little about Syria except for conflict-related news during these two years, are told that Syrian opinion is controlled by state media and free speech is prohibited there. It is difficult to talk freely in the country on a range of sub subjects, but much and most of what people are concerned with can be discussed and can be created through art and literature. Given that we are told that there is such severe censorship, what could emanate from that so-called brutal dictatorship that could be of any value to cause TV dramas to be embargoed and a valued industry crushed. Anyone familiar with the high quality and public issues Syrian television producers address will understand. In the last 12 or 15 years, Syria rose to become a major quality and influential source of original TV drama. Their productions captivated the entire Arab-speaking world even eclipsing Egypt, whose highly popular dramas had hitherto prevailed. Some are 20th century, others are set in much earlier periods of Arab history, and I believe, in general, Syria had remained the main source for historical Arabic productions, akin to what you might find from Britain. You know that in the English language, Britain excels in its 17th, 18th, 19th century dramas. Syria has that place in the Arab world and in Arab culture. These dramas hold a deep significance 
across the Arab world through their portrayals and their reflections of cultural values and historical events. Contemporary social concerns, religious fanaticism, homosexuality, and the abuse of women. The work of these brilliant Syrian artists is known across the Arab world. The Arab public also recognizes that few can match Syrian productions in their historical accuracy, their readiness to address the subjects noted, as well as Palestinian aspirations and rights. Now, one thing I just want to mention, I viewed only one Syrian production focusing on the Palestinian struggle where Believe it or not, the Israelis are the bad guys. <laughs> I mean, you would never see this anywhere in Europe or certainly not in America. And the focus of the film I watched was the Israeli military, actually. You know, they're gruff, they're corrupt, they're crude, they're masochistic, they're, um, you know, they're really dis disagreeable people. And those are played, by the way, by Syrians who have learned Hebrew in Syria to take up those positions, you know, in the films. Then there is the issue of authenticity. Syria is known to have the highest standards in the region in historical research applied to the arts and in Arabic language. And until this war began, Syria, you may know, was the primary country that people from all the world traveled to to study Arabic and they had developed their Arabic language institutions to an extent where they were doing very very well in terms of their methodologies and they were attracting and therefore it was like another part of the economy that was what that was being uh, stimulated by the arrival of two or three thousand that I knew of when I was there mainly young people studying Arabic Besides the technical, literary, and entertainment value of the stories of these dramas, Syria's TV dramas represented a fading political consciousness, that is, Arab nationalistic ideals. Many productions invoked a regional pride hard to find elsewhere. This was not unplanned. This was part of the government strategy and the government ideology the sense of pride in culture which Syria, especially after the demise of Iraq as a center of cultural, linguistic, historical research, Syria maintained. And this, I believe, is one of the aims also of the American desire to destroy Syria. This is the last Arab state that is really uh, such, so committed to Arab values and history and the language. Despite its low quality news coverage and the stifling of political dissent and dialogue in Syria through TV dramas, the country helped celebrate and sustain Arab national sentiment and secular, secular values.